Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, if you've been with us, you'll know that we've been going through Unit 5 of the AP U.S. History curriculum. And so far, what we've seen is that there is an increasingly tense situation between northern states and southern states about the institution of slavery. Now, in this video, we're going to continue looking at that growing tension through the lens of regional attitudes towards slavery. And to add some conflictual flavor, we're going to look at regional tensions with respect to immigration, too. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, Let's get to it. Now, before we get started, let me just mention something I've made to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. It's called the AP US History All View Packet, and it's got exclusive video content from this guy. It's got note guides and answers to the notes. It's got practice multiple choice questions and answers to those questions. So, you know, if that's something you're into, link in description below. Now, when we're talking about regional conflict, as we shall in this video, one of the main beefs between the regions of the United States had to do with slavery, and especially its expansion. But that is not the only fight Americans were having during this period, they're also fighting over immigration. So let's deal with immigration first, and then we'll talk slavery second. So in the years prior to the Civil War, a huge number of immigrants, mostly Irish and German, arrived on the American shores seeking a new home. And when they arrived, they largely settled in cultural enclaves, which is to say they lived together in ethnic communities where they kept alive their cultural customs and languages and religion. Many of the Irish immigrants settled in New York City and, more to the point, New York's Five Points neighborhood. And for the most most part, they lived in slums where diseases ran rampant, unemployment was the growing norm, and infant mortality rates were among the worst in the country. Some of the German immigrants settled in urban locations on the coast, but a greater proportion of them moved west in order to find land to farm. And perhaps it won't be much of a surprise to you to find out with all these new immigrants coming into the United States, a pretty significant movement rose up to oppose them. Most acutely, it was a strong anti-Catholic nativist movement. Now, when I say nativist, let me explain what I mean. Nativism is basically a policy of protecting the interests of native-born people against the interests of immigrants. And native-born people in this case are white folks. Wait a minute, but weren't most of the Irish and German immigrants white too? Well, they ain't my kind of white. Fair enough. And apparently, the Irish weren't the nativist kind of Christian either. The Irish had committed the intolerable crime of being Catholic Christians, not Protestant Christians, and as such, they were the targets of some pretty stiff nativist invective. In fact, this nativist sentiment became so strong that a group of folks even organized organized a political party around opposition to immigration. They were called the Know Nothing Party because apparently if you would ask them what they believed, their stock response was, We know nothing. Anyway, this movement of nativism was essentially concerned with limiting immigrants' cultural and political influence. And with that, we'll leave immigration and nativism to stew. But don't worry, the 1880s are coming, and so are the Chinese, so there'll be plenty of people for them to hate on later. Anyway, let's move on to talk about regional tensions with respect to slavery. First, let's talk about the difference between the North and South regarding labor systems. The economies of the North and the South were moving in dramatically different directions during this time period. In the North, the economic engines were turned by free wage laborers largely working manufacturing jobs in factories. The southern economy, on the other hand, was largely fueled by enslaved labor working agricultural plantations. And population-wise, the north was growing much more rapidly than the south. And as I mentioned in the last video, many northerners didn't object to the expansion of slavery on moral grounds, but rather on economic grounds. For them, if a new territory entered the Union as a slave state, then that would make it near impossible for free wage laborers to compete for jobs. And that conviction gave rise to the Free Soil Movement and later the Free Soil Party. They were largely in support of the Wilmot Proviso, on which see the last video, and aimed to keep the lands granted by the Mexican Cession free of slavery. Now, to be clear, the Free Soilers weren't interested in abolishing slavery in the South, they just didn't want it to expand into the new territory. And Southerners, of course, saw this conviction as a very real threat to their constitutional rights to slavery. But now let's have a look at those folks in the North who actually did want to ban slavery in the South, and everywhere for that matter, the abolitionists. This group, which counted in its number both free black and white members, were a minority in the North. Like, it's easy to think back to the years before the Civil War and think about it in simplistic terms. Like, the South was for slavery, the North was against it. But it's a little more complicated than that. Abolitionists in the North were actually a minority in that region, but what they lacked in numbers, they made up for in volume. They ended up being a highly influential group precisely because of the effectiveness of their strategies and tactics to make their message heard. Some of them used 
used words. Others assisted fugitive slaves to escape, and still others used violence, and let's look at each of those in turn. With respect to words, let's have a look at printed words and then spoken words. Now, in terms of printed words, I mentioned William Lloyd Garrison's abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator in a previous video. It was extremely influential in the abolitionist community. Now, another written work that was extremely impactful was Harriet Beecher Stowe's publication of her novel Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852. Despite this book being a work of fiction, Stowe depicted the dehumanization and brutality of slavery in graphic detail, and this book sold like crazy. Now, instead of slavery being some amorphous plantation system way down there in the South, Northern readers saw clearly the evil and wickedness that slaveholders perpetuated on their enslaved labors. Southerners who read the book were outraged in an attempt to ban it wherever they could. Now, with respect to spoken words, it's hard to beat the sheer beauty and precision of the abolitionist speeches of Frederick Douglass. As a man who had himself escaped slavery, he was able to weave together an abolitionist pathos, logos, and ethos like few others could. Secondly, with respect to assisting enslaved people's escape, I need to tell you about the Underground Railroad. Basically, this was a series of trails and safe houses by which people enslaved in the South could find safe passage to the North. Tens of thousands of enslaved people made use of this passage to freedom, some of them traveling all the way to Canada to be assured that they were out of range of the enforcement of the stricter fugitive slave law passed under the Compromise of 1850. Thirdly, with respect to violence, I need to introduce you to John Brown. Brown was a fierce abolitionist and believed that the only way for America to be freed of the scourge of slavery was by means of a slave uprising against the slaveholding South. And to that end, he devised a plan to raid the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia in 1859 in order to steal weapons, distribute them to enslaved folks, and ignite an armed rebellion. Now, Brown and his men were able to capture the armory, but they were repulsed in short order by a rival battalion led by none other than Robert E. Lee, on whom more in another video. Now, all told, John Brown's plan fell to pieces and was utterly unsuccessful, and soon after, he was hanged for his crime. And so he really didn't do much damage, and therefore probably shouldn't have been a big deal, right? Well, here's where I tell you that John Brown actually had connections to many of the leading northern abolitionists of the day, including Frederick Douglass. And so to the southerners, they saw this raid as symbolic of what the abolitionists were really all about. To the southern mind, it made all the sense in the world that the northern plot against them was not merely to abolish slavery and thus destroy their way of life and economy, what the abolitionists really wanted was to incite a race war in which the whites of the South would surely suffer terribly. Now, clearly that conviction is going to lead to further fracturing between the two regions, but we'll have to leave it there for now. Well, all right, that's what you need to know about Unit 5, Topic 5 of the AP U.S. History Curriculum. If you need help getting an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May, then I would love to help you. Click here and grab my ultimate review packet. If you want me to keep making videos, go ahead and subscribe, and I shall oblige. Heimler out.